Maxfield. Yes, good morning, Your Honor. <clears throat> Lisa Maxfield, also here with Ms. Broby. My bar number is 844-337, and my last name is spelled M-A-X-F-I-E-L-D. So let's, there's a few things to take up before we bring the jury in. Uh, yesterday, <laughs> defense had an objection to the form of the verdict form, and I understand the sides have not reached an agreement on modifications that may or may not need to be made. So I guess I'll have Ms. Maxfield remind me of what the issue is. Your Honor, we were concerned that the verdict form didn't have the 10-2 for not guilty. Counsel informs me that because there's, a, there's an instruction that does um, advise the jury of that, that this is how the state typically does that. So if it's how it's usually done. I well, guess. there is an instruction. I, I was thinking about it this morning myself. And to be honest, I, I don't actually remember. So I, I'm not saying one way or the other. I don't actually remember there being language on most verdict forms at all about how many jurors need to agree on something. But I, I having said that, I may just not remember. Uh, but the very last instruction I'm going to give is to inform them about how many jurors need to agree for a guilty finding, how many need to agree for a not guilty finding, uh, as well as, even though it's apparently not really at issue in the case, uh, how many jurors need to agree on the yes or no questions. Um, so I, mean, I, I guess think my, as long as there's an instruction, Okay. Maybe it, maybe it was much ado about nothing. <laughs> All right. Uh, Mr. Overstreet. Uh, Your Honor, I think where this idea of language on the verdict form comes from is before uh, unanimous verdicts were required. And the reason I say that is because there was never an instruction for the crime itself on the verdict form. Mm -hmm. But there was a, a further instruction to explain if you have these questions, these uh, um, enhancements right. that needed to be questioned, the instruction was that 10 of the people that found uh, the individual guilty had to also be the same 10 people that right. answered yes to these questions. So I think the confusion is this language that's in the middle of this verdict form does give instructions on the for the questions. Um, and it's probably unnecessary because of the uh, instructions that are uh, given to the jury I think that you could take out that middle language. You're talking about the sentence in order for the jury to return a finding of yes on these allegations. All 12 jurors must agree that the state has proven the allegations below. Yes. So, I mean, it might just read better if we take that out and I give the instructions on what's required for each of the findings. Right. So that would, that would be my suggestion is basically the second half of that paragraph. Okay. And if that if that works for defense, that's what we'll do uh, before we get this to the jury. Um, I did want to raise two other matters. Uh, the first is we've got an. I think you both have seen juror number fifteen has forwarded an email exchange. Oh, you haven't seen it. Oh. All right. So so let me explain what you're about to see. Uh, juror 15 apparently sent an email to their supervisor uh, informing them just sort of how much longer they would potentially be here. Uh, the supervisor sends an email back, which makes an inappropriate comment. Uh, and the juror has brought it to our attention, just as I instruct jurors to do if anyone tries to talk with them about the case. It does not seem like the juror is in any way, shape, or form engaging with the supervisor about the case, but the supervisor has made this comment, which you'll see on page one, the second email. Uh, and so I at least want to afford the attorneys an opportunity, if they think it's necessary, to question this juror outside the presence of others to see if there was any further conversation uh, or if any way this you know, anything the lawyers would like me to ask so that I'm the one asking instead of them, uh, I'm happy to do so. And Judge, um, the juror is in the back row, third from the far end. So back row, third from the far end, uh, meaning third from the right. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay. Oh yeah, that's fine. So, uh, but just again, just if you guys look up there, uh, sh I don't know if it's yeah, male or female, I know who but she is. okay. Probably should. What do you think, Chris? Yeah, I think we probably should. All right. The so the reference is lost on me. I don't know who Carol Baskin is. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, um, that's fine. I think a lot of people may. Uh, so I, I guess the questions I would ask is whether this uh, manager has attempted to speak to her or communicate with her in any other fashion about this case and whether or not uh, this comment would have any influence on the juror's deliberative process. I'm not sure what else to ask, which is why I wanted to see if either side has any suggestions. I guess we could... I, I mean, I guess if we were just doing voir dire and we knew that, that she had a boss with these thoughts, we'd want to know uh, whether she she might feel pressure to return to work. Okay, um, sure. Yeah, because I, and I don't know, uh, you know, I don't know exactly what the supervisory relationship is here, so I'll ask about that too. So why, so before we call in that juror though, uh, you know, yesterday I had asked the sides to consider uh, whether or not you would stipulate to, if during deliberations, a juror becomes unavailable, we hope that won't happen, but if it does, have the side had any thought process further on whether or not they would stipulate to one of the alternates replacing that juror? We okay, I, I see defense uh, shaking their head affirmatively. We would um, also stipulate, Your Honor. All right, and I just want to make sure, I'm sure she does understand this, but I want to make sure that Mrs. Brophy understands this. So even though I'm sure your attorneys have explained it to you, I'm going to explain it as well. Uh, we have four alternate jurors, and I think we were all under the assumption that if one of the regular jurors fell ill during deliberations or had some sort of circumstance happen where they couldn't return, that uh, one of the alternates would come back. They'll be instructed not to discuss the case or look anything up, but an alternate would come back and they would have to start the deliberations all over again, but there'd be a potential replacement for the juror who left. Uh, there's a statute which actually says that kind of stipulation is supposed to happen if it's going to happen uh, before the trial starts, and it didn't. So. The question I have posed to the attorneys and to you as well is whether or not, despite that statute, uh, the sides would agree to that because if the answer is no and we wind up losing a juror during deliberations, it would lead to a mistrial and the whole thing would you know, be retried. Uh, well, I mean, unless the sides agree to a jury of 11 people over 12. So that's what we're discussing. And I wanted to ask you uh, whether or not you agree that a alternate could be used in that way. I do. Okay. All right. Okay. So with that, then let's bring back juror 15. Okay.
Okay, everyone can be seated. Um, Juror 15, thank you for bringing the email exchange to our attention. It's, it's exactly what we would want a juror to do to let us know if there's been attempts at outside communication. I just wanted to ask you a few questions. Uh, other than this email, has this individual tried to communicate with you in any other way about the substance of the case? No. And how, what kind of supervisory position does this person have to you at work? He's a project manager, so he manages um, the different projects, and one of, a couple of them are ones that I'm designing. Okay. So it's, I, wouldn't, I don't feel like I work for him. I just feel like we work together on the projects, so I can't jump off of him and I say, can you, I guess, manage this? Sure. As part of it, interact with people on top of it. And sometimes he comes to me and he says, all right well that may answer what I'm gonna ask next but I'm gonna ask it anyways uh, do you feel any particular pressure as a result of this to decide this case one way or the other uh, going back to work knowing he feels this way apparently um, no. and I, I should ask does this communication impact your thinking at all one way or the other about how you'll evaluate the case all right, I'm going to just see if the attorneys have any questions. Um, we'll start with the state. I do not. Does defense have any questions? All right, okay, again, thank you for bringing it to our attention. We'll, we'll take you back to the other jurors and bring everyone in soon. Uh, yeah, why don't you leave it running just... Okay. Um, you can stay standing if you want, but you don't have to. <laughs> I know it's up and down, but uh, it's fine to sit until the jury comes back. Oh, okay. All right. We are. Right. Uh, anything else before we call for the jury? No. All right, let's call for the jury.
And Mr. Overstreet, when you're ready. Thank you, Your Honor. You can all breathe a sigh of relief. This is the last time you're going to hear from the lawyers. I promise. I don't want to take up too much time this morning. Uh, in fact, I had hoped to do this last night, but it seemed a little constrained for time. Um, but I do want to cover some areas. This is, this is not the opportunity for me to go back and re-argue the entire case. That's not what I'm doing. What I'm doing is responding to what defense said yesterday. And we feel the need to respond because defense, once again, has twisted words and made their own statements. And they even supplement the evidence at times. What I mean by that is when there's a hole, when there was no uh, evidence on a particular matter, the defense attorneys would just say something to fill it. And as you've heard over and over again, have I urged you to be cautious when listening to defense counsel when it's not things that are based in evidence? I have a list of things I want to talk to you about as evidence of that. And this list is not exhaustive. We just simply don't have the time to go through all of it. But what defense was saying is that they're not really acknowledging that Nancy was turning off of 17th Avenue onto Jefferson. Apparently, they didn't listen to their own defendant's testimony. That's exactly what she said. She said it was me. That is me turning off of 17th onto Jefferson. But defense can never commit to that. Ms. Weinmiller said that they decided, I'm sorry, that the Brophys decided to live in Vernonia or in that area, and that their money would go a lot farther there, that real estate's a lot cheaper out there. Now, there may be some common sense to that, but you heard no evidence in this courtroom about what they were looking for and what price range and whether they could even afford it. In fact, what Ms. Weinmiller stood up here and said is they were going to get probably over $400,000. Of course they could afford something in the Vernonia area. But the reality is the house sold for $565,000, even after the yard was cleaned up and the house was ready for sale. That's not $400,000 in profit. They were maybe looking at getting about $200,000 in profit. So just use your own common sense on what in the world they think they're going to buy with land for $200,000 and own it outright. But again, no evidence of what that would look like. She then stated that, well, Ms. Guay only looked at the tower in Vernonia, the one servicing Vernonia. That's simply not true. Ms. Guay testified and told you that she checked a few towers in the area that could potentially service the Vernonia area. Did she go wide out 20 miles? No, of course not. But I think she testified that within 10 miles, she checked those towers. And there was no activity other than the activity on Highway 26. So once again, defense doubles down on this idea that that's exactly what Nancy's out there doing. And there's actually no evidence of that. Defense was clearly confused about the dates of March 26 and 27. She gave a presentation yesterday about how we are asserting that Ms. Brophy went out there on the 26th, shot her gun, and then went to lunch. That's simply a false statement. That wasn't the evidence. That's not what I told you. The 26th is the day that she went to lunch. That's also the day that I said she didn't have enough time to shoot. She went out there probably doing recon like Nancy always does, and then went to lunch. It was the next day that she had plenty of time to go out and shoot a gun. Plenty. Again, defense is up here saying, I think her words were amazing, amazing precision of a shooter. That this person who shot Dan Brophy had amazing, amazing precision. Couple things about that. There is evidence that this was very close range, despite defense saying there isn't. What's the evidence that this happened at close range? The trajectory of the bullet alone tells you it's at close range. The person who shot Dan Brophy wasn't standing at the door shooting across the room. We would have had a much different trajectory. The person was standing almost directly behind Dan Brophy. The bullet that went in his back went slightly to the left of the center of his back when it tried to exit his chest. So the person standing behind him had to be nearly directly behind him to accomplish that type of shot. Well, what was behind Dan Brophy? Those two big silver tables that you saw. 
So the shooter either had to be in front of those tables, very close to Dan, or in between the tables, just another maybe two feet farther away from him. That alone tells you that this happened at a very close range. And Ms. Jacobs told you that Ms. Brophy disclosed that whether she was admitting that she was the shooter or not, but Ms. Jacobs was saying that Ms. Brophy was indicating that it was an arm's length away. Now, what does this mean? Well, defense goes back to this idea that it's such a precision shot. How could somebody without hardly any gun experience do this? Well, first of all, we don't know that that's the first time Nancy shot her gun. That's the evidence that I have that Nancy shot her gun. Because we're relying on real evidence in this courtroom, not speculation. But nonetheless, what it does show you is that Nancy had the opportunity to be very close to Dan and shoot him. And again, even if he knew she was there, he wouldn't be startled. This is somebody he loves, somebody he trusted, would turn his back to, to continue his work. Once again, a reason why it's so unlikely that this could be somebody else. Somebody gets that close and Dan doesn't know. Dan probably knew that Nancy was there. Even though de defense again asserts over and over and over that we claim that he didn't know, he didn't know about a lot of things, it's not true. And think about it. If we're talking an arm's length distance, and this is where Dan Brophy's standing, and I'm assuming I have a bigger wingspan than Miss Brophy, but let's use mine anyway. We're here. I'm shooting. And it's, such, it's so unbelievable that I would hit my target. This isn't the world's luckiest shot, as defense would have you believe. This was calculated. Now, did she intend to sever his spine? Intend it to go through his heart or lungs or anything? I don't know. But she squared up and shot him straight through the back. And the second shot, there's no precision at all. When Dan's laying on his back, paralyzed, she just walks over to him right through his chest. What kind of precision is that? Anybody could make that shot. Defense then doesn't stop there with their statements and assertions. They go on and say that somebody claimed that Nancy Brophy abandoned the Brophy family. I don't know where you heard that. Nobody said that. And in fact, I would argue, of course, she didn't abandon the Brophy family. That would seem awfully suspicious. You're the grieving widow and you just disappear. You don't talk to the family anymore. Of course, she continued to talk to the family. But defense claimed that, they, that she didn't, or that there was a claim that she didn't. The defense attorney also asserts claims that Dan and Nancy were, that we're asserting that Dan and Nancy were secretly planning a divorce. Don't know where you heard that. That wasn't in evidence. I never said that. I don't believe Dan and Nancy were secretly planning a divorce. Dan certainly wasn't. Dan had no intentions of leaving this marriage. No evidence that he had any intention of leaving this marriage. Nancy, on the other hand, wasn't planning a divorce either, but instead planning the murder. That's her way out. There are no plans for divorce. But yet defense attorneys they continue to stand up here and say, that's what the state's asserting to you, and it's just false. Defense also asserts that the state claimed that Dan would force his wife to work so that he could have this precious yard in his garden. You didn't hear that either. I didn't say that. There was no evidence of that. In fact, I would argue the opposite. I don't think Dan would do that. I don't think there's any evidence to support that. But defense doesn't stop there. They assert that we proposed that Dan didn't even know about the storage unit. I never said that. No witness ever said that. All you heard was that Nancy rented the storage unit. That does not mean Dan did not know about it. Defense then asserts that, they, that we claimed that Dan didn't know about the yard cleanup. That's ridiculous. Of course he knew about it. He has eyes. He lives there. He can see that there's yard cleanup being done. He may even have his hand in it. 
where we disagree with defense on this is not that he didn't know about it, but what the purpose was for. Because the story now is that we're cleaning it up so we can subdivide it. And now you know the subdivision story is garbage and not true. So Dan clearly wasn't thinking that. But even the sale of the house being imminent. I don't know that Dan knew that. I don't think there's any evidence that supports that Dan was really on board with this plan that they're selling the house now. Because look at the house and look at the physical evidence that you had that was described to you. Nobody was starting to get that house ready for sale. Nobody. All they did was a little bit of yard work. Because remember, most of that yard work happened after Dan died. But look at the rest of the house and look how much help had to be brought in and how long it took to get that house ready that summer. They spent three months with all that help. That's what it took to get that ready for sale. So at the pace that Dan and Nancy were going, they were not heading for a sale of that house. Ms. Weinweller stood up here and said that Dan must have signed for the slide and barrel that was delivered on February 28th. They said that. They actually said in their opening that they would prove that to you. And then she sat up here yesterday, stood up here yesterday, and said that Dan had to have signed for it because Nancy wasn't home that day. And again, what is defense doing here? Completely ignoring what the actual evidence was. Patrick Cowan, the gentleman who sold the slide and barrel on eBay to Ms. Brophy, sat right there and said, no signature was required. The Postal Service could have actually just put it in their post box. So why would defense stand up here and say, nope, signature was required. Dan must have known about it. Other than just to mislead you and confuse you. Ms. Weinmiller went on then to tell you that Nick White also thought that the blackberries needed to be cut. First of all, he never talked to the Brophies. So I don't know how he would know that the blackberries would need to be cut. And what he did say is if I did encounter blackberries on the property, I would have cut them myself to gain access. No need to go spend $21,000 to James Denny to clear these blackberry bushes to start the plan for subdividing. Ms. Weinmiller also told you that Nancy didn't sleep the night before, because, before the murder because she was working on her story. Nancy testified that she stayed up later than Dan, and that was normal. She didn't tell you that she was writing. But it has to fit the narrative. Everything the defense counsel gets up here and says has to fit their narrative. And what, did Ms. what Ms. Brophy actually told the detectives, too, about that night was that she couldn't sleep and because she couldn't, didn't know why. So you heard three different versions of events. Ms. Weinmiller then told you that Dan would have had to bring in those two carts, and she showed you pictures. He would have had to bring in those two carts that morning. That would have taken more time. Problem with that is Ms. Weinmiller apparently didn't listen to Ms. Brophy's testimony when Ms. Brophy said that Dan brought the carts down the day before. On top of the misleading statements that Ms. Weinmiller and Ms. Maxfield have uh, made during this trial, they fed you several red herrings. Now, defense counsel mentioned red herrings yesterday. I'm not sure that everybody knows the definition of a red herring. So I just want to cover that. The Oxford Dictionary defines the red herring as something that is intended to be misleading or distracting. That's what defense counsel is trying to do here. They don't actually have evidence to counter the state's evidence. So they just throw out a bunch of stuff to distract you and are asking you to not to look at the evidence. Look at this. Look at this other thing. So what are the red herrings that they sent to distract you with? Again, not an ex exhaustive list, just a few examples. Talked about suspicious people in the area. What relevance does that have? Because they want you to believe without any evidence whatsoever that, well, it must have been them because they're suspicious. And what's suspicious about them? They're walking. They also say that there's a person who appears to be a lookout. I don't know if you remember the video, but I believe the person that they're talking about is a guy who's kind of standing near a wall nearby, about a block away. But if he's a lookout, this is after the murder. This is after the police arrived. What's he a lookout for? It's a red herring. Even the term lookout is a red herring. Ms. Weinmiller sat up here, stood up here and talked about 
a book of mushrooms that Dan owned. What does that mean? Nothing. She talked about a red bag missing from the Culinary Institute. But we don't actually know that. Because Nancy, if you talk, listen to her, doesn't actually know if Dan brought a red bag that morning or not. She wouldn't know either way. The only time you heard about a red bag is from Nancy Brophy during the death notification, that she thought that Dan should have a red bag with him. That's it. Not what's in it. Anything of value. Nothing else. It's designed to distract you. Maybe to, to suggest that this, this was a robbery. This person stole Dan's red bag. Not his money. Not his wallet. Not his phone. Not his keys. Not his car. Some random red bag. But you heard nothing else about that. Nothing. They also talked about general homelessness in the area. And they tried very hard, if you recall, with every witness who had experience in that area to get them to say that homeless people were scary in that area. But yet, one after one, each person came in here and told you, ah, I mean, they're there. It's not that bad. Never been assaulted. Never heard of anybody being assaulted down there. In fact, you did hear from two gentlemen that defense counsel brought in here, and that was Fred Hartbett and Francisco Jaramillo, who worked at the BMW across the street. What they told you is, yeah, there's homeless people in the area. And uh, we were there that morning coming in and out, and we saw nothing out of the ordinary. Not suspicious people, not anything concerning these two guys who are very familiar with that area. Sounds like they've worked down there for decades. But defense wants you to believe that there was a homeless problem when witness after witness basically said there wasn't. And then finally, oh, how many times did you hear about a waffle iron and saw pictures of a waffle iron? Did you ever make sense of that? Why were they showing you pictures of a waffle iron? Why did they ask so many questions about a waffle iron? This is a prime example of a red herring. Get you thinking about a waffle iron. What does it mean? Was it there? Was it not there? Who knows? There were some pictures of a waffle iron at the crime scene. It seemed to be fully intact and just sitting there where uh, people said that it always was. What does it mean? They're just trying to distract you. So defense goes on to ex explain the finances. I am not going to spend more than a minute talking about this because clearly they were in financial trouble. I don't know who they paid to come in here to tell them that their finances were perfectly sound, but that is ridiculous. Their finances were awful. Ms. Weinmiller claimed that Dr. Rubinson, I'm sorry, Mr. Rubinson said that Dan was worth more to Nancy alive than dead. Even after I just gave the closing argument and showed you how that's not true. She still stood up here and said, no, he's worth more alive. But Dr. Rubinson, Mr. Rubinson said $1.13 million over the course of 17 years. Dan dead now is $1.6 million now. Well, $1.2 million now and another $400,000 paid out over time. I don't know what trial the defense team was watching, but those numbers don't work. Dan was not worth more to Nancy, monetarily. Then she, Ms. Weinroller goes, well, how do we even know Ms. Brophy knew about the workers' comp, that $400,000 that she'd get over time? How do we know she even knew about it? She owned a business. She better know about workers' comp. She ran a catering company, had 25 employees. She better know about workers' comp and how it works. But again, it's not about the money. It's the lifestyle that Nancy desired, partially driven by the amount of money she would get, but she needed a different lifestyle, as we've said, that Dan could not give her. But then defense points out, well, why would Nancy make all these purchases with her on-point account? A joint account. Clearly, Dan would have access to that. Clearly, Dan would know about these purchases and have questions. Well, first of all, who cares if he knew? Nancy would just say, oh, it's for riding, Dan. And Dan being Dan would probably be like, whatever, and move on. So who cares if he knew? But I am going to argue to you, Dan had no idea what was going on in that bank account. Dan didn't even really know what was going on in his own bank account. I'm going to show you what's marked as States Exhibit 86. This is a long record, so you have to go down to page 530. 
And what you'll see there is that Dan Brophy hasn't had a debit card to this account since 2016. So we know he's not spending out of this account using his debit card because he doesn't have one. You also can think back to the pictures that you saw of Dan's wallet contents. There is not an on-point debit card in there. You can also listen to what Nancy Brophy told detectives that morning when she rattled off what should be in his wallet. And she does not mention an on-point debit card. And it's because he doesn't have one and does not use that account. How do we know he doesn't use that account? Because he also doesn't write checks out of it. There's no checks written from Dan out of the on-point account. There is also no deposits from Dan's employment going into that account. This is a joint account, sure. Could Dan use it? Yeah, he has a legal right to it. But for all intents and purposes, Nancy used that account, and Dan had no idea what was going on in it. Now, you can look to Dan's actual account, the Wells Fargo account, where his money is being deposited, where he does make expenses from. And I would argue to you, he doesn't even really know what's going on in that account. Why do we know that? Because he texts Nancy and says, hey, did my check hit my account yet? Nancy is management. She manages the funds. She manages the household. Dan checks in with her about the finances. And there's further proof of that in the Dearest Dan letter that you heard about. Clearly, this guy, Mr. Brophy, does not use online banking. And we know that because Nancy Brophy wrote to him how to access it. She had to, she had to instruct him on how to open the computer and get it started. So he clearly wasn't doing any online banking. Mr. Brophy, as you've heard, as I've stated over and over, is a pretty simple guy, not one to use technology. And if he did, he would have to be instructed on it. Defense counsel then moves on and talks about the window of opportunity. She first said, well, it's only a four and a half minute window on June 2nd for the murder to happen. But then she corrects it, says it's five and a half minutes. But then she sort of questions the window altogether and kind of says, well, Dan had to do so many things in there, and that would take too much time. Uh, and so you know, Nan the time that Nancy was there, she wouldn't have had enough time to kill him, I think is what they're asking you to, the implication to be. But the things they rattled off would maybe add up to a couple of minutes. Walking a cart from the cooler to the back, hitting the button on the coffee pot, maybe or maybe not gets the money out of the piggy bank, and then now he's back over filling up water when he's killed. That doesn't take very long. Nancy probably did wait for that, or she was there with him, and he was undisturbed by her, and she was waiting for an opportunity where he turned his back to her. But nonetheless, the, the argument is interesting from defense because they're suggesting that that window maybe was much more narrow, making it even more unlikely that this would be a random person. The breakdown of that morning is actually that the alarm was taken down at 7.22.30. You've heard that over and over. Ms. Weinmiller said, well, the next person gets there about 7.33, 7.35 or something. That is wrong. Miranda Bernhard got out of her Uber at 7.29. That's where that six-minute window comes in. And if you think about 7.29 as opposed to 7.28 and some change, we're talking seconds after Nancy Brophy drove away from the Culinary Institute that Miranda Bernhardt arrives. And remember how she arrives. She gets out of the Uber on the corner of 17th and Jefferson, and she walks right by that roll-up door. She's not reporting anything suspicious at that time. So at 729, it is reasonable to believe that Dan has already been shot and killed. So that window is five and a half, six minutes long. And think about this. They, Miranda Bernhardt is also the same person that when she arrives, she walks around the corner and she sees the person that she thinks looks, or I'm sorry, that, that uh, has the same characteristics as the person that's been identified as Oscar Taylor. Across the street, up the street a little bit, up Madison, up by the, up by the uh, admin building, where all those cans are. So if defense is asserting that Nancy actually didn't have time to kill Dan, 
in that window of time. Neither did Oscar Taylor, by their own argument. Then defense switches gears and they say, well, why would Nancy drive her own van down there? It's a fair question, I suppose. But what is she supposed to drive? You rent a car locally, that's awfully suspicious. Rent a car the day before your husband is murdered, that seems awfully suspicious. So would borrowing a car. You borrow a car the day before the murder? But why did she drive her own van? As I stated yesterday, Nancy is smarter than everybody. She's done her research. She's been to the Culinary Institute, knows there's no cameras. She's probably driven that street and thinks there's no cameras. Because what are the cameras that sunk her? Interior cameras in businesses. You saw numerous. She didn't know those were there. She probably looked up that street and said, there are no cameras out here. I'm fine. Now, interestingly, defense proposes that, well, there's cameras on the BMW building, the old property room, that were obvious. OK. If Nancy knew those were there, does that not just bolster my argument to you that Nancy did not go all the way up to Madison Street, that she actually stayed in front of the Culinary Institute? Because if she's afraid if she goes too far up that street, she might be seen by those cameras, then she's not going to do it. So she either didn't know the cameras were there, didn't notice them, or she did know they were there, and that's why she stayed in front of the Culinary Institute, knowing she would be out of the view of the cameras. Defense then goes on to explain guns to you, and why Nancy purchased the guns, and what the purpose was. But I think what became painfully obvious is that Defense Council has no knowledge of firearms, as evidenced by the fact that they stated that they had no knowledge of firearms before they would question witnesses about guns. I believe Ms. Maxfield said that at least twice. I don't know anything about guns, but here I go. Because yesterday, Ms. Weinmiller stood up and gave you a completely incoherent explanation for why the slide on the gun show gun was out of battery. What do I mean by that? She stood up here and said, well, sometimes the slide is forward if there's, a, if there's a zip tie in it. Sometimes the slide is back off the gun if there's a zip tie in it. And uh, I will tell you, that's not how it works, as you saw, and as the actual people who know things about guns testified to. If you put a zip tie through that gun and it is seated properly on the frame, that slide barrel is sticking off the back of the gun because the zip tie creates a gap and it pushes the slide off the back of the gun. But Ms. Weinmiller said, well, sometimes it's forward. No, it's not. That's not true at all. And then she explains, well, the guy at the gun show who sold it to her, Mr. Glenn Denning, he was manipulating it to show Nancy how to do it. Well, first of all, this guy knows how to put a slide and barrel back on a frame. And he sent Nancy out with a properly seated slide and barrel. But defense wants you to believe, well, maybe he messed it up somehow. Now, this is where the wires get crossed on defense. The original story given to you was that Nancy told the police that she put the gun away and never touched it, never handled it after that, because it was ugly and heavy and all that stuff. But then Nancy got up on the stand and said, no, 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 I played with it, I messed with it. I removed the slide and barrel. I don't know if Ms. Weinmiller missed that part of the testimony, but she completely ignored it yesterday in her argument. Because if Nancy removed the slide and barrel, then she's the one that manipulated and caused that slide and barrel to be unseated or out of battery, as you heard. But Ms. Weinmiller was trying to get you to believe that it's possibly the people at the gun show, which makes no sense. They forgot the narrative, and they're telling you different stories. Speaking of different stories, you heard Ms. Weinmiller stand up in opening and say, Ms. Brophy bought that slide and barrel on eBay because she saw a pop-up ad, she just couldn't help herself, and she still needed a slide, even though she already had two, failed to explain why she needed it. And so she just went ahead and bought it. Ms. Brophy told you on the stand, uh, I bought it 
intentionally, I went to eBay intentionally and purchased it. And when I said, well, wasn't it a pop-up ad of some sort? That's what your lawyer said. She turned to her lawyer and said, did you say that? They had a script that they were trying to follow, a narrative that they needed you to believe, and they messed it up over and over and over because it's all lies. It's not based in evidence. So then they go, well, we can't just not explain why Nancy remembers because that will sound ridiculous. We're going to bring in some doctors to tell you why she doesn't remember. And I'm going to address the two things that Ms. Weinmiller addressed yesterday. One, not attending. The idea here being that Ms. Brophy was just driving around, lost in her world, um, thinking about writing. Now they said she was writing and jotting down notes, but she doesn't do that. She doesn't jot down notes. She's, she sat there and told you she writes whole books in her head. But now she's jotting down notes. But there are no notes. Gets a little confusing, right? So nonetheless, she's not attending because she's so busy doing this writing stuff, even though there's no evidence of that. The problem with that is that Dr. Best sat up here, sat up here and told you, somebody who's not attending is more likely to attend and would be expected to attend when they're doing something out of the ordinary. So yes, if Nancy drove downtown every single day, she might block out part of that drive because she's used to it, just like all of you have probably done. But she doesn't do that every day. She goes to her local drive through Starbucks, she comes home and she writes. So partially getting dressed and driving downtown would seem a little out of the ordinary for Miss Brophy, and she should have attended. But it doesn't matter. Because even Dr. Reesberg, their own expert, got up here and said that, well, when you don't attend, specifically he gave an example of driving, it doesn't mean you don't remember driving. You just don't recall specific parts of the driving, just like you all have experienced, I'm sure. What Dr. Reesberg did not say is that, well, when you're attending, you must just black out a certain section of time and you have no memory of what you were even doing at all. And think about your own experience when driving and doing that sort of zoning out for a minute. Do you ever look back and go, gosh, I don't even remember driving. I don't remember getting in my car. I don't remember getting home. You don't remember anything? No, because it's not real. So they also told you, well, okay, so she's not attending, so she's not committing things to memory, so she just blocks that out. And then she has this trauma, which prevents her from encoding these memories. But besides that, we're going to go ahead and pile on and say, must also be retrograde amnesia. Remember, these are two separate theories. But they're just kind of throwing the kitchen sink at you and hoping you bite. The problem with that is Dr. Reisberg specifically talked about Rebo's Law. If you remember, he said 30 minutes before a trauma is where you would expect that sort of problem developing memories. 30 minutes. And then you go back in 30 minute increments and you expect the memory to get better and better and better and better the farther away you get away from the trauma. That was Rebo's Law. Well, when Miss Brophy's receiving the news that her husband's dead, it's almost 11 o'clock in the morning. 11 o'clock. So if she's going to have, let's give her the benefit of that. Let's say 10.30. Go back a half an hour to 10. Then her memory should start getting better. 9.30. 9. 8.30. 8. 7.30. 8, 7. Got to go back even farther, right? Because she left her house at 6.30. So you got to go all the way back to 6.30. You actually have to go before that because she had to get dressed to leave. So 6 o'clock in the morning, almost five hours before, Rebo's Law says, what, what's, no, we'd expect you to have some memory of that. But no, complete blackout. But then when faced with the idea, well, you can't have just a complete blackout because that would sound ridiculous to this jury. Well, okay, no, I do remember some stuff from that morning. Now all of a sudden she remembers that she woke up, that she talked to Dan about a leak, that he carried some towels downstairs. She partially got dressed, then blackout. 
None of this makes sense. If you're trying to make sense of it in your head and you go, I don't get it, I can't fathom these stories, it's because they're all designed to make you confused. Because defense is hoping that your confusion somehow equals reasonable doubt. And I can assure you, confusion is not reasonable doubt. To try to support the idea that Nancy, OK, she's downtown. They're willing to accept that now. But then she got home. And she just carried on about her day. She doesn't remember this, but she used her computer, apparently. Now, when they had their expert up here talking about a computer, he said, well, I saw activity about 8.48 in the morning. Looks like she's doing some insurance stuff. Then she looks like she was working on some writing. And Ms. Maxfield said yesterday, for quite some time, was her direct quote. Ms. Brophy was on that computer manipulating a flash drive and some files for 18 minutes, not writing a book. In fact, there's no evidence she wrote a thing. The expert told you there was movement from files onto a flash drive. And it looks like one of them was opened. Can't tell if she wrote a single thing. It's a poor alibi. It's a terrible alibi. But nonetheless, Nancy Brophy's attempt at an alibi. Now, what I found interesting about that testimony is they didn't ask their own expert, well, when did the activity start that morning? Because they didn't want you to know. They wanted you to assume there was activity on that computer earlier that morning. So I asked. And he said, oh, yeah, computer wasn't turned on until 831. Oh, no activity before that. So she's not up writing. She's not up in bed writing. She's not on our computer. 831, think about that timeline. She leaves downtown at 728. She's home by about 738. Give her a couple minutes for traffic. Let's call it 740. Her neighbors are out at 745 to 8 o'clock, and they see Miss Brophy pulling up frantic. So Miss Brophy drives home. She sees her neighbors, wants to make sure she's seen for her alibi, addresses them with the dog issue. No dogs in sight. She goes back home, switches out that slide and barrel, and then she jumps on her computer. Defense couldn't, couldn't pass on the opportunity to double down on Oscar Taylor yesterday. They want you so badly to believe Oscar Taylor's a murderer. I'm not going to rehash why you should be offended by that, but you know. The narrative is that Oscar Taylor navigated this maze of the Culinary Institute, which he's never been in before, murdered Dan. Then he apparently went over to the restaurant where the wine is kept and stole from the restaurant. Now what I want to point out, if it's not all already obvious how ridiculous that sounds, where the restaurant is. So Oscar Taylor apparently came through the storeroom, found his way this way, went back here, murdered Dan for no reason whatsoever, didn't take his money, didn't take anything else, as you've heard. Then he somehow goes either this way into here, or he comes back and goes down this way, somehow has to make it back to the kitchen where the wine is stored, assuming it's not locked up. And what does Oscar Taylor take, apparently? Takes a bottle of Cabernet, and for good measure, he's going to take a candle. That's their argument for Oscar Taylor. Ms. Weinmiller said absurd a few times yesterday. I can't think of anything more absurd than this Oscar Taylor theory. Specifically, when you think about defense's own argument about the time frame. That Oscar Taylor waited for Dan to do a few things before he went in and murdered him for no reason whatsoever. And that he basically had a couple of minute window. And then he goes in. He happens to have the same exact making caliber of gun that Nancy Brophy does. He executes Dan Brophy. Then he walks out with a bottle of cab and a candle and goes right back to canning. That's what you have to believe. And you have to believe that was all done while Nancy Brophy was there. It's ridiculous. That is not reasonable doubt. Finally, defense once again couldn't help themselves. They had to address Andrea Jacobs. 
If you recall, I didn't even bring her up in my closing argument. You don't have to believe her. The evidence is still the evidence. You don't have to believe her. But defense, just like they did when she was on the stand, went on the attack. I'm not defending Andrea Jacobs, I can assure you that. I'm a prosecutor. She committed crimes. She also pled to those crimes and is serving a prison sentence. What I want you to consider when you think about Andrea Jacobs and whether you believe her or not is consider her motives, as you're instructed to. Consider her motives and consider the manner in which she testified. What were Andrea Jacobs' motives to testify here? Remember, she didn't come forward. She had this conversation with Nancy over a year ago. She didn't come forward. She didn't come forward looking for a deal then. She didn't bring it up. She didn't bring it up this year either, in April, when Detective Merrill found her and went and talked to her, knowing that she had been housed with Nancy Brophy and seeing if she had anything to say. She told Detective Merrill what had happened, and then we drug her up here against her will. She told you how many times, I don't want to be here. Now, all she said was that Nancy had a slip of the tongue. They're having a discussion. Nancy, of course, being the chatter that she is, can't help herself but talk about her case. So she's talking, and they're relatively, I think, jail friends is probably the best way to put it, whatever kind of friendship that can be. But they nonetheless talk to, to each other. And Ms. Jacobs told you, well, Nancy was explaining to me how far away the shot was. And she said it was uh, this far away. And then she says, well, I was this, I mean, wait, it was this far away. A slip of the tongue. That's what she told you. Is a slip of the tongue so hard to believe after you watch Nancy Brophy's testimony? I would argue that it's probably not that much of a stretch for you to say, yeah, I could see that. I must confess to you all that when we say that Andrea Jacobs didn't get anything for her testimony, that's not true. Now, did she get a benefit in her case? No. Is she hoping to get a benefit in her for some case that maybe she's going to be prosecuted for? She said no. We told her she wasn't getting anything for it. But she is getting something. She got two sheriff's deputies to come down and pick her up from Texas and give her a free plane ride to Portland so that she could sit here and be publicly shamed and badgered by Miss Maxfield. Miss Maxfield went at her hard. Don't, you must admit, you must admit. Talk, let's talk about your crimes. Let's talk about your convictions for the world to see. This woman who wanted nothing to do with this case had to sit up there and take that. So she got that free ride. She got to be publicly shamed. And most of all, she got threats to her safety and her well-being. That's what she got in exchange for her testimony. You should consider that when you consider whether you believe her or not. And consider the fact that defense counsel was so afraid of her testimony, so afraid of it, that not only did they badger on the stand, then they brought in several people to call her a liar. They brought in two doctors, just as many doctors as they had to testify about Nancy Brophy's memory and, and her, uh, what kind of person she is, they brought in just as many doctors to call Miss Jacobs a liar. That's how scared they were that you would believe Miss Jacobs. I'm wrapping this up, I promise. I do want you to remember that reasonable doubt is actually based on common sense and reason. Right? It's not beyond all doubt, as you've heard although I think defense counsel's characterization would like you to lean that way. But that is not the law. We've given you the puzzle pieces to put together the picture. There might be a puzzle piece missing that you might want to know about. But you, when you take a step back from that puzzle and you look at it and there's a puzzle piece missing, you can still see the picture. You know what is there. Most of the excuses and reasons that you heard from the defense counsel throughout this case and during closing arguments came from Nancy herself. Self-serving statements 
developed over the course of almost four years. The other places that information came from was from defense experts, like about the retirement plan, the only people you heard about it from. Or they came from those supplemental statements from the lawyers themselves, or from their questions. None of that, none of those are evidence. Ms. Weinmiller told you that the last time Nancy saw Dan was that morning when they talked about the leak. The reality is the last time Nancy saw Dan was when she stood over him and looked him in his eyes. As he's breathing in his last, last bit of life, paralyzed, injured, but he wasn't dead yet. So as she looked into his eyes and pulled that trigger one last time, that's the last time she saw him. That sparkle in Nancy's eye that defense counsel gave you several adjectives for, that sparkle was not Nancy having fond memories of Dan. If you saw a sparkle in her eyes, it was the crocodile tears conjured up to get your sympathy. Just as Nancy told you on the stand, anyone is capable of murder. Anyone. That would include Nancy Brophy. And during her last rambling rant on cross-examination, she blurted out this sentence, how do you defend against the truth? Whoops. You can't. You can't defend against the truth. Nancy is guilty of murdering her husband, and it is now up to you to, de to deliver the justice for Chef Dan Brophy and the rest of the Brophy family. I am asking you to return a verdict of guilty. Thank you. All right, I'm going to give you your final instructions before you head to the jury room to deliberate. And when you return to the jury room, select one of your members to act as a presiding juror. The presiding juror has no greater voting weight, but is to preside over your deliberations and be the spokesperson for the jury. You should then deliberate and find your verdict. If it becomes necessary during your deliberations to communicate with me, do so in writing. I will consult with the parties before responding, and Ms. Liu will give you her contact information so you can reach her. Now, no one except for you, the jurors, is to be involved in your deliberations. Therefore, do not tell anyone, including me, how many of you are voting not guilty or guilty until you have a lawful verdict or have been discharged. Guilty verdicts must be unanimous, which means that each and every juror must agree on a guilty verdict. But not guilty verdicts may be non-unanimous. At least 10 jurors must agree on a not guilty verdict. If you're divided 9 to 3, for example, you do not have a not guilty verdict. Now, the rule is different regarding the alleged additional facts, which you will decide only if you reach a guilty verdict. In order to answer yes, that an additional fact has been proved, all jurors must agree that the additional fact has been proved beyond a reasonable doubt. However, if any juror finds the additional fact has not been proved beyond a reasonable doubt, the answer would be no. For example, if you're divided 11 to 1 in favor of an additional fact, you do have an answer on that fact, and the answer is no. Now, when you have arrived at a verdict, the presiding juror will complete and sign the appropriate verdict form. And after you have reached your verdict, you'll signal Ms. Liu. The court will then receive your verdict, and I will read it. Now, in a moment, I'm going to announce the alternates. I do want to thank you again for your service. There is, of course, no way to know in a trial of this length, at length how many jurors we could potentially lose. And I would point out that we have already lost two in this case. So there is one last instruction that I need to give to the alternate jurors before I announce them. You are not yet discharged from the case. 
you must still refrain from talking about the case or looking up any information on the case until a verdict is reached. Although it's unlikely, the possibility exists that one of the regular jurors could begin deliberations and not be able to complete them for some reason. If that were to occur, an alternate could potentially be called to replace that juror. That's why it's imperative that you not yet discuss the case or look up information on it. We will notify the alternates when a verdict is reached and they have been discharged from the case. And at that point, you'll be free to discuss the case with whoever you'd like and look up any information you want on the case. So here are the four alternates. Uh, numbers, and I assume by now you all know your numbers, but numbers 54, 58, 59, and 61. So when you go back with the rest of the jurors to the jury room, you can collect your things and go. Uh, I know it may be disappointing, and again, I'm sorry, but we do appreciate the fact you were here and that you could potentially still be called to come back. So with that, uh, in a moment, I'm going to swear Miss Liu and my judicial assistant, but we need to get her. So I have the two of you raise your right hands. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that you'll take charge of this jury and keep them together until they've reached their verdict? That you will not, unless by order of the court, allow any communication to be made to the jury except to ask them if they have agreed on a verdict? That you'll not communicate to anyone the state of their deliberations or the verdict agreed on and that you'll perform these duties to the utmost of your ability? I do. All right, then, Miss Lou, uh, I'll have you take the jury back, but let's leave the record going. Okay, no. give me just one second. Okay, thank you. Uh, all rise for the jury. What I wanted to ask the attorneys and also to let them know, and everyone can be seated, thank you. Um, if we get a jury question, I would ask the, if the attorneys remain within 15 minutes or so from the court so that we can get everyone here to go over the question. Uh, I'll ask defense, and maybe you don't know till you see what the question is, but do you know whether or not Mrs. Brophy would want to be present for any jury questions? Yes, yes she would okay. like to be here. Okay, all right. Uh, um, I would you like me to mark this email exchange as soon as it's redacted as court exhibit a yes uh, we, we are going I wrote on this one we are going to mark just so the sides are aware a copy of the uh, email exchange earlier pertaining to juror 15 a redacted version of it and marked as courts exhibit a so it'll be in the record okay um, we will Go on record. Well, Unless, hold on a sec. Oh, Let me see. It looks like both sides have something. I think something. we do need to make an exception to the court's failure to give the uh, inference instruction the defense requested. Okay. And then for the state? Your Honor, this is just more logistical for uh, interested parties. Um, when a verdict is reached, is Your Honor uh, going to set a time in order to receive that verdict, or do you plan to receive it immediately? Well... Uh, I mean, it, it'll, are you asking like a, a certain cushion of time? Yes. Uh, primarily, um, there are a lot of family members that would like to be present. And sure. Of well, course, I, I think if it's today, it's not necessarily as big of a deal, but if we move on into multiple days, I don't think that they're going to sit at the courthouse. 
understand. Um, you know, I guess I could give a cushion of a half hour, but I don't want to go any further than that because if we get a verdict that's towards the end of the day, there's other logistical considerations. So I, I can give a half hour cushion. I know the court has no control over this, but if Ms. Brophy could be housed at MCDC, it would make it easier for us to move her in and out. And Thank you. What's that? I don't think we have her here. Right. I, I mean, I can certainly I recommend that, okay. <laughs> and, I, and I do. But as you know, I, I don't have much control, if any, over where she's housed. Uh, but we'll make the recommendation. Anything else then? All right, we will be in recess.